Okay, so let's go back and look at the digestive system. Actually, going back, when we're talking about the digestive system, just a few words that are synonymous with talking about digestive system is gastrointestinal tract or GI tract or alimentary canal. All of those can be interchanged with the term digestive tract. So looking at digestion, we know that life depends on it. And then some terminology that's important, ingestion is the process of taking food into the body. This takes place in the mouth. Digestion is where the process of breaking down the food into small chemical units. And this occurs mostly in the stomach and the small intestine. And then absorption is the process whereby the chemical units pass into the blood and are carried to the liver. And this occurs in the small intestine. And then of course, also equally important, water is absorbed through the large intestine. <clears throat> so it'd be good to get to know where each of these things take place. Metabolism is the process in which the chemical units are converted into energy for use by all the organs of the body, and this takes place mainly in the liver. And then excretion or elimination is the removal of any remaining indigestible material. And of course, throw some credit, these pictures that I've showed are from awkwardyeti.com. Super great comic strip. So looking at the digestive system components, we have the oral cavity, which includes the tongue and the salivary glands. We've got the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, which has three parts, the gallbladder, pancreas, liver, large intestine also has three parts, and then the anus. So you can look at the picture and see roughly where they're located within the body. And then we'll go through the features for the most part of each of the components. So carnivores have what we call a monogastric gastrointestinal system, and it's the simplest of the gastrointestinal systems. So meat is the most easily digestible of all the foods that can be taken in. That being said, this is the same with omnivores. And we, if we think about the difference between who's a carnivore, who's an omnivore, carnivores are cats. Cats are obligate carnivores. They absolutely need meat in their diet to survive. They need the amino acid taurine, which comes from meat. Whereas dogs, in fact, technically are considered omnivores, where they can certainly live on a vegetarian diet and they get a lot of their nutrients from the vegetative sustenance that the herbivore had eaten that they then subsequently eat. So if that makes sense, if the herbivore ate a ton of <clears throat> forage, a ton of grain, and then the dog or the wolf is eating like the intestines and the guts of that herbivore, of course, with that, they're getting some plant material. So dogs definitely can live on a vegetarian diet. Cats cannot because they're obligate carnivores. So moving down the line, we've got the oral cavity. So this includes the teeth, the tongue, the salivary glands. And of course, it's responsible for prehension, which is grasping of food with the tongue or teeth, mechanical breakdown of food, which is mastication, and lubrication of food so that it can be then swallowed and passed into the esophagus. We have the tongue, which is such an important part, and it starts off that uh, <clears throat> mechanical digestion. It starts off manu or mechanical digestion, it's moving food around, it's responsible for ingestion, it has taste buds, it creates a bolus of food for swallowing, and of course it can groom the fur, so it has papilla. And especially when we're looking at cat tongues, they have those wild little hooked papilla, like Velcro. The tongue is also playing a role in thermoregulation, hence why dogs pant to release a bit of heat from their body. When they're really hot, they're able to vasodilate the vessels on their tongue and release some of the heat from their tongue. So that's the role it plays in thermal regulation. And of course, it can help them with vocalization. So my example of this is if you have a dog that howls, if you look over at their little mouth when they're howling, their lips are curled into an O and their little tongue is curled as well. And then random point, dogs, cats, mammals in general have an artery that runs on the underside. So the ventral side of their tongue is it any use to us? Just a small clinical point. Quite often when we're in surgery, if you think about it, where we would normally place the stethoscope over their thorax to listen to their heart, normally that's covered by a surgical drape, so we can't access it very well. So one way to get a quick and easy pulse is to have a feel of 
the underside of an animal's tongue when they're under anesthetic. Of course, we would never attempt this while they're awake because you'll definitely get bitten, but it's something that is a nice little tech tip. <clears throat> and then we look at teeth. So teeth, we have brachydontic, and then we have hypsodont. Brachydontic means that they are fairly low in profile, so they're not very long teeth, and they cease to grow once they've reached their final size. Bit of terminology, the membrane that's covering the gums is known as the gingiva. And we look at the gingiva a lot of times to identify the health of the gums. So in this picture here, we have a brachydont, which has a low profile, so it's a fairly short tooth, compared to a hypsodont tooth, which is quite long. So examples of animals that are hypsodonts, we've got horses who have hypsodontic molars and they continuously grow throughout their lives. We have guinea pigs and rabbits, which have hypsodont incisors and need to be trimmed quite often. So looking at the anatomy of the tooth structure, We've got, looking at our basic tooth here, we have the crown is essentially the top of the tooth, the top pointy part of the tooth. The root is the part of the tooth that is below the gums, essentially, and below the gingiva. And then within that, we have enamel, which is the shiny white outer covering. Dentin forms the main part of the tooth. Cement holds the tooth firmly in the gum, and then the pulp cavity contains blood, capillary, and nerve fibers. So really, really important that the pulp cavity is healthy, and in young animals, the pulp cavity is quite large, and in older animals, it changes and it gets smaller due to wear on the teeth. And then you can have a look, so the tooth here on the right has one singular cusp, whereas the tooth, or sorry, the tooth on the left, the tooth here on the right has three cusps. So that's many, many cusps to the crown of the tooth, so many sharp points. And when we get into the different types of teeth that are into the mouth, then you can understand why some have more cusps than others. And so the way we look at and label the teeth in the mouth, we have the incisors, which are essentially the teeth that are shown when humans smile. So I like to think of them as animal smile teeth as well. We have the canine teeth, which is the long, sharp, pointy tooth, and they have four canine teeth. We have premolars, they have four on each side of the upper arcade, and then dogs have two molars on the upper aspect of each arcade as well. And each tooth is essentially repeated in different numbers on the bottom. So the main goal of carnivore on omnivore teeth is ripping and tearing of flesh from their prey. They're adapted for grinding of flesh and plant materials. And of course, how are they different than herbivore teeth? Herbivores have flat teeth for the most part. Likewise with herbivore teeth, depending on which type of herbivore it is. So if we look at sheep, for example, Sheep don't have upper incisors, so certain herbivores don't have upper teeth or upper incisors, and then certain herbivores have gaps in their teeth, but you don't have to know too, too much about that. And then which tooth is unique to carnivores? The answer there is the carnassial teeth, and these are very, very powerful teeth. So these teeth right here are the carnassial teeth, okay? So it's this... It has um, two cusps on the top and three cusps, so points on the bottom. And they are large, very powerful teeth that are specific to carnivores. And if you hear fuzzy, weird noises in the background, that is my cat. As soon as I open the computer, he comes up and starts purring, so my apologies. Okay, eruption of teeth. Why are we concerned with knowing the eruption times of teeth for dogs and cats? And what can it tell us about the animal? Well, age, it will tell us about the age. Also, if there are any concerns with hidden teeth or super nerm <laughs> I can't say that, supernumerary teeth. So if you think about this word supernumerary, it means more than the normal amount of numbers. So extra teeth. 
So we know that teeth in general erupt at a certain time. And so when an animal, when we check their teeth, if they have all their teeth erupted, if they only have their baby teeth, that tells us a lot about the animal's age. So we look here, we've got kitten teeth, cute little tiny kitten teeth that are oh so sharp. And then we have full adult teeth, which are much different in size. And of course they have much more teeth than a kitten. And then here, this is one, so looking at, uh, again, why it's important to know when adult teeth come in and when baby teeth should be gone, this cat here has two uh, canine teeth. So what it looks like, I wouldn't be able to tell necessarily without an x-ray, but it looks like it has a retained deciduous, so a retained baby tooth, as well as its adult canine tooth. The adult canine tooth always has this longitudinal groove once the animal hits maturity. So this looks like it's a retained deciduous tooth. And you might think there's not much wrong with a retained deciduous teeth, but in fact, and you can see here, they can start to get an accumulation of calculus and bacteria between the two teeth. So it's like us, if we weren't able to floss our teeth, then we would start to get that accumulation as well. So these guys can get some issues with that. Hence, if they have extra teeth, we tend to get them extracted. So looking at our timelines, the tooth type and deciduous dentition. So we've got incisors, which are the deciduous, so the baby teeth. For the dog, they come in at three to four weeks. And then cats are interesting. The entire dentition, so all of their teeth, all of their baby teeth, start to erupt at two weeks and is generally completed by four weeks of age. Canines, so dog canine teeth, those four um, sort of eye teeth, those typically come in around five weeks. Premolars for dogs, generally between four to eight weeks. And then molars in their baby teeth, they're absent. So they don't have molars as babies. Permanent, so adult teeth, we tend to get the adult incisors at three and a half to four months of age for dogs, 12 weeks for cats. The canines or eye teeth, five to six months for dogs, 12 to 20 weeks for cats. Premolars, the first premolar at five or four to five months, and the rest of the premolars at five to seven months. And then for cats, full dentition is present by six months. And then molars, we're looking at five to seven months for a dog and up to six months for cats. So the main thing is generally, generally, with the exception of dog premolars and molars, most teeth, most adult teeth have come in by six months of age. So if an animal is getting spayed before six months of age and they've got extra baby teeth hanging around, we tend not to take them out. If they're getting spayed after six months of age and they have a lot of baby teeth, then the vet will probably end up taking them out so that they don't cause problems. So some differences between dogs and cats, because there are always differences. We've got the dog dental formula, the permanent teeth. We have three incisors top, three incisors bottom. One, and sorry, this is per quadrant. So if we divide the mouth into four sections, so four arcades essentially. So we've got the upper right side, the upper left side, the bottom left side, the bottom right side. If we're looking at one quadrant, so one quarter of the mouth, then they would have three incisors, they would have one canine, four premolars, and then two molars on the top and three on the bottom. So total adult teeth for dog is 42 teeth. So what would be ideal to know out of all of this definitely is that dogs, adult teeth, they have 42 teeth. Cats, on the other hand, only have 30 teeth, and the difference comes into play with their premolars and their molars. So looking at the differences there, premolars, they have three on each side at the top and two on each side at the bottom, and then only one molar at the top and one molar at the bottom. So we keep that in mind, they have 30 teeth. And here's just another way to look at it. It's a different pictorial image, 42 and then 30 for the cat. So it'd be good to know, generally, the number of teeth that they have. 
Okay, a bit of review. Ingestion occurs in the mouth. So that's taking food into the body to start the process of digestion. Digestion occurs in the blank and blank. It occurs in the stomach and the small intestine. And that is both mechanical and chemical digestion. So mechanical digestion is the actual churning of the stomach or the peristalsis. And then chemical is the addition of things like hydrochloric acid or bicarbonate to further break things down. Metabolism may take place or mainly takes place in the liver. The monogastric carnivore system is the blank type of digestive system. It's the simplest. If you start looking into ruminants, so cows, they start to become much, much more complicated. Mastication is a form of blank breakdown of food. It's a form of mechanical breakdown of food. When dogs pant, they're using their tongues as a form of, or as a tool for thermoregulation. The blank blank contains the blood vessels and nerve fibers in a tooth. Well, the answer there is the pulp cavity. And which type of tooth is unique to the carnivores and omnivores? It is the carnassial tooth. And it's that very large tooth that works to rip and tear flesh. Moving on down the line salivary glands so looking at salivary glands this picture here identifies where the salivary glands are in the mouth and they're not necessarily directly in the mouth but they empty into the mouth so mainly what we're looking at in the salivary glands is 99 percent water and one percent mucus some animals have enzymes for digestion so horses have amylase and humans have amylase in their saliva. Cats, dogs, cows, not so much. I think pigs do as well, but I could be wrong. So essentially with horses, they actually start their mechanical as well as chemical digestion in their mouth, but not so much with dogs and cats. The goal of the salivary glands, of course, is to produce uh, lubrication for the food. They can also assist with thermal regulation and when does saliva production increase? We start to see a major increase in saliva production when there's food present. And that's based on classical conditioning. So looking at, we go back to Pavlov's dogs and classical conditioning, we hold the food in front of the dog, they get used to the fact that they are going to be eating soon, and then all of a sudden you can get this copious amount of saliva production. A few of you mentioned in class that your cats salivate when they're happy and when they're purring like crazy. And then also, animals salivate when they're about to vomit as well. Okay, carrying on, we have the pharynx. So we talked about the pharynx with the respiratory system, and now we have the pharynx in regard to the digestive system. So the pharynx, of course, is the throat, and it's the shared passageway between respiratory and digestive tracts. And remember that the pharynx consists of, has the hard palate, that's mainly the roof of the mouth, and then carrying on through to the back of the throat is the soft palate. And then once food makes its way past the pharynx, it's going to divert away from going into the larynx, hopefully, and it's going to work its way down the esophagus. So the esophagus is a muscular tube from the pharynx to the stomach. So from the throat to the stomach. It lies dorsal to the trachea, so it lies above the trachea. <clears throat> and the esophagus is lined with smooth muscle and stratified squamous epithelial cells. So it has the capacity for lots of stretching. So stratified, we're talking about multiple layers, and these cells and these muscles allow it to stretch. Peristalsis, of course, is a wave-like muscle contraction, and it propels digestive tract contents along the tube ahead of them. Antiperistalsis occurs during vomiting, so antiperistalsis, essentially that means reverse peristalsis. So normally we would have the mouth over here. When the animal swallows, we get a contraction behind the bolus of food, and it's pushing that bolus of food down the esophagus and into the stomach. 
antiperistalsis, we would just flip the arrow the other way and the contraction would happen on this side of the bolus of food. One thing that's important to note, the difference between vomiting and regurgitation, which I think we've gone through already, but if not, um, here it is. <laughs> vomiting is active, so muscles are heavily involved. If you ever think about, you know, if you've had to vomit, you've got muscles in your throat that are working, your stomach muscles are just going like crazy because they are churning the food and the digested materials up. Regurgitation is passive and the muscles aren't actively involved. So animals that regurgitate, all of a sudden they get this, this stomach contents coming back up and it's not a big production. So they're not, con they're not contracting their muscles and their abdomen and they're not making any huge retching noises to get that vomit up. It's just regurgitation. <coughs> so one form of muscular contractions throughout the gastrointestinal tract are, is peristalsis, that, that was on the last slide. And then we also have rhythmic segmentation, which is another form of movement that mixes and breaks food apart within the gastrointestinal tract. So this is kind of a back and forth, back and forth, chopping and churning of the gastrointestinal tract. Before we carry on, it's important to note the goal of digestion is to break down food into its usable molecular parts. So protein is a usable molecular part. We talked about this at the very start of our lectures and it's polypeptides converted to amino acids, which are usable. Carbohydrates, which are polysaccharides and disaccharides are converted to glucose and other simple sugars, such as monosaccharides. And then of course, fats are converted to fatty acid and glycerol, which is monoglycerides. All right, so the food has worked its way from the mouth into the throat, down the esophagus, and then plop, it's got to make its way into the stomach. So here's the esophagus, and then opens up into the stomach. So the stomach has a few different functions. It has a huge capacity for storage. So this area of the stomach, called the fundus, can stretch massively. It can like 10 times its size. It can stretch extremely to accommodate a high volume of food. The stomach is very much responsible for breakdown of food, so both mechanical and chemical, and it's also responsible for protein digestion. The esophagus enters the stomach on an angle in the cardiac region. So this area is called the cardiac region, and it's surrounded by the cardiac sphincter muscle. So it'd be good to know that the cardiac sphincter is in the I guess it's the cranial when they're they're laying or standing up the cranial aspect of the stomach so the cardiac sphincter when food comes down the esophagus first it oops first it has to work its way through the cardiac sphincter which is a tight muscular ring that either allows food in or completely closes off the stomach okay so that's the entrance to the stomach as the stomach expands, so as food comes in and gets bigger and bigger, the fold of the stomach against the cardia and the cardia region closes the lower end of the stomach. So looking here, this area here, if you think about the fundus getting really, really, really big, it actually pushes up against the cardiac region of the stomach and it creates a fold and it closes off the esophagus. So this reduces the risk of reflux, so passively regurgitating acid into the esophagus. And in some species, such as the horse and the rabbit, the closure is strong enough to prevent reflux or vomiting permanently. So horses and rats are not physically able to vomit. So this is the cardiac region of the stomach and the cardiac sphincter lives there. All right, super important about the stomach. This is what the inside of a stomach looks like. It's covered in these, this sort of brain-like looking material. So it's all these folds and it's always glossy because it's covered in mucus and hydrochloric acid. So the folds of the stomach, which you're seeing here in the picture that look like brains is called rugae. And the purpose of the rugae is to increase surface area just like in the brain, we have a whole bunch of folds in the brain to increase surface area. 
Likewise, what you're seeing here, that pink soft tissue is called gastric mucosa, and that's the innermost lining, the innermost endothelium of the stomach. And it contains many, many, many glands, especially in the fundus of the stomach. So looking at the glands and the specific cells of the stomach, and these are good things to get to know, parietal cells in the stomach they secrete, so they release hydrochloric acid. So they release stomach acid to help break down food. And what stimulates them to produce hydrochloric acid is gastrin. And gastrin is produced when we start to get hungry and we think about food. Goblet cells create this thick basic or alkaline mucus. They create this thick protective mucus and what that does, it helps protect the, the um, stomach endothelium, so the stomach mucosa helps protect that tissue from the hydrochloric acid of the stomach. And then we have chief cells which secrete pepsinogen which is then converted to pepsin. So now the food is working its way through, it's getting this influx of hydrochloric acid to break it down, and then it's undergoing mechanical digestion as well in these thick or these big segmental contractions. So now the food is a thick liquid, and that liquid is called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. It moves now through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum the first segment of the small intestine. So at this point, this material called chyme is, vi oops, is very acidic. So what's happening here, it's working its way from the fundus to the body of the stomach, through the pyloric antrum, and here, where it says pylorus, here we have a pyloric sphincter. Okay, so it would be good to know where the cardiac sphincter is and where the pyloric sphincter is in the stomach. So remember that the chyme is super acidic right now as it works its way out. So one little thing here is a clinical application called, and I want to draw your attention to gastric dilatation volvulus. So gastric dilatation volvulus is a disease that you'll probably see in clinic one day if you work in small animal vet practices, whereby a dog, typically a large breed dog, so medium to large breed dog, where their stomach actually flips upon itself. So the most common dog breed that this happens to is a Great Dane. So if you picture a Great Dane, they're you know 130 pounds and up, they're really large breed dogs, and they have a very large chest. While their stomach, when they're standing up, sits in the cranial aspect, right next to their thorax. So it sits in the very cranial aspect of their abdomen, very close to their thorax. And what can happen if they eat a lot of food and their stomach bloats a little bit or a lot, they have this big bulgy bloaty stomach and it swings and it swings and it swings if they're playing or running around or rolling over. And eventually it has the potential to flip over on itself. So as you can see here in the picture, so we've got normal stomach, so we've got esophagus, the fundus, the body, the pyloric antrum, working its way to the small intestine, that's a normal stomach. And then here we've got a stomach that's bigger than normal because it's bloated. And then right here, the pyloric aspect of the stomach comes up, flips around, and it ends up cutting off circulation to the pylorus and to the esophagus. So what ends up happening, these dogs need surgery immediately. So these dogs tend to act, and again, this is important to get to know, the clinical signs or clinical symptoms of these dogs are restlessness, so they can't get comfortable. They're generally pacing, they're panting, and sometimes their abdomen is actually bloated out quite often to the left-hand side. But most often they are pacing and they're restless, they are panting and they're trying to vomit, but the only thing that's coming up is foam or nothing at all. So they are constantly trying to vomit, but nothing's coming up because it feels like they need to vomit. They're extremely bloated. They're getting all the sensors sending an input from their stomach, 
but they can't vomit because they've cut off circulation to their esophagus. So if you click on this link here in your PowerPoint at home, you can have a look and you'll see a dog that is pacing and panting and not doing particularly well. And just remember this is an absolute emergency and the owner needs to bring them in right away. So this is a dog that's severely bloated and you can see that the side of their abdomen is extremely enlarged. So quite often the vet will use a large intravenous catheter, poke a hole through their skin into their stomach, that's called trocharizing, and release a ton of gas. And then we'll go to surgery. And the surgery is all about untwisting that stomach and then essentially pexying it or attaching it to the body wall so that it doesn't flip again and this is remember that in an x-ray or on an x-ray gas or air is black have a look at this this is all black so this is a ton of gas and they say that x-rays of GDV so gastric dilatation volvulus they say it looks like Popeye's arm so that's Popeye's bicep and then his little arm curls around with his fist so that's a typical x-ray for GDV. And then this here is a normal dog abdomen. You can see there's the stomach, the um, large intestine, kidney, small intestine, spleen, large intestine, bladder, and then that's the gastro gastric, gastric, intest gastric dilation, dilatation volvulus. My goodness, I'm stumbling over that. We'll go back to it here. Gastric dilatation volvulus. Okay, so it's good to know what it is, who it tends to happen in, which is most often in large breed dogs with a barrel chest, so a large chest, but it can be in medium breed dogs as well. I've seen it happen in Border Collies, German Shepherds, it's quite common. And then of course the answer is surgery, unfortunately. All right, saliva is 99% blank and 1% blank. So it's 99% water, 1% mucus. This is the shared passageway between the respiratory system and the digestive system. That, of course, is the pharynx. The wave-like muscle contraction that propels boluses of food through the gastrointestinal tract, peristalsis. Which area of the stomach has the largest capacity for storage? That is the fundus. And the esophagus enters the stomach at the blank sphincter. So that is at the cardiac sphincter. All right, moving on down the line, we have the small intestine and it's divided into three main components. It's divided into the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And it's super important to note the spelling of ileum, I-L-E-U-M, because remember that in the pelvis, we have the wings of the ileum, which is spelled I L. I U M. So if you write I L I U M for the small intestine, you won't get a mark for that on any sort of test because, again, the wings of the ileum, of course, are not in the small intestine. So the main function of the small intestine is enzymatic digestion and absorption of nutrients. And the small intestine is covered in thousands of villi and microvilli to increase again the surface area for secretion and absorption. So looking at our pictures here, on the inside of the intestine, the endothelium, so the skin on the inside of the intestine, is covered in these tiny, 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 tiny little finger-like projections. And then on the finger-like projections, which are called villi, the finger-like projections, on those, on the cells, we have microvilli, which are tiny, 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 tiny little brush border cells. So here are the villi, which are the finger-like projections of the small intestine. And then when we highlight one of those epithelial cells, we've got brush border of microvilli. One thing to note, it's important to just know the difference a little bit. So the brush border of microvilli here, again, the goal of the microvilli is to increase surface area. So it makes their more surface to engage in absorption and secretion, but taking up less space. So those little microvilli are still involved in absorption and secretion as opposed to cilia and ciliated cells remember that the cilia help to shift 
foreign objects, or in general materials away from the cell. So looking at the small intestine, most of the nutrient absorption takes place here. And then just looking at how it's laid out, so this is a human version, but it's the same, more or less the same with dogs and cats. So we've got the esophagus, the stomach, and then it works its way into the duodenum, which is the shortest part of the small intestine. From there, the duodenum meets with the jejunum, and then it meets with the ileum, and then it works its way to meet with the large intestine right through here at the ileocecal junction. Oh, I feel like this slide should have been back there. <laughs> Sorry. So villi and microvilli I talked about, but again, villi are small finger-like projections within the wall of the intestines. They can be seen with the naked eye, and microvilli are microscopic brush borders on the actual cells themselves to further increase surface area. Both of these features are all about increasing surface area for absorption and secretion. So then we get, uh, here, let's go back. So looking at the microvilli and villi, so capillaries bring small molecules from the breakdown of carbohydrates and proteins to the liver through the hepatic portal vein. A lymphatic capillary known as a lacteal exists in each of the villi, and each lacteal carries chyle, a white milky fluid resulting from fat digestion from the small intestine to the main lymphatic duct in the dorsal abdomen. So a couple points here. If we look at our villi, so this overall finger-like projection, we have little tiny venules, little tiny uh, lymphatic vessels, and then little tiny arterioles. And then of course within them, these then become capillaries. So the capillaries absorb those nutrients from the food digestion itself, so from the lumen of the intestine, and they bring that back through a larger vein right here to the liver. And we'll talk about that a little bit further with the liver. And then likewise, this middle little finger-like projection is the lymphatic lacteal, and each lacteal, lacteal carries a uh, chyle, which is resulting from fat digestion, into the main lymphatic duct in the dorsal abdomen. So again, that's just looking at the interior exchange pathway for nutrients and important components of food digestion to get from the intestines to where they need to be within the body. Moving on down the line, so if we talk about the small intestine, we absolutely have to talk about the pancreas. So the pancreas secretes bicarbonate and digestive enzymes into the duodenum. What's the benefit of bicarbonate in the duodenum? I wonder if I have the answer. I do. It neutralizes the acid in the chyme, and that's a typo that should say C-H-Y-M-E. So it's not chyme, it's C-H-Y-M-E. So remember that the hydrochloric acid from the stomach makes the chyme very, very acidic when it's entering the duodenum. If it maintains its acidity, so if it stays super acidic, as, it's work, as it works its way into the duodenum, it's gonna burn the duodenum. So it will actually burn the cells and the inside lining of the duodenum. If the pancreas is not functioning properly, properly the acidity of the chyme, and again, that's a typo, I'm so sorry, but the acidity of the chyme would burn the mucosa of the intestine and it could create a duodenal ulcer. So these are points that are very good to know, perhaps for a test or a quiz in the future. The pancreas secretes specific enzymes to break down specific components of food as well. So it secretes protease or protease, sorry, for further breakdown of protein, lipase, which breaks down fat activated by bile salts, and then amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates. So clinical application, there's another disease, it's called exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI, and it's most commonly found in German shepherd dogs. And in these cases, you can see here at the shepherd on the right, he's really, really skinny. So if you have a look, you can see his or her ribs right through there, and then you can see each vertebrae of the spine. 
not ideal. So this dog's really, really skinny. So what's happening in these cases of EPI, the pancreas doesn't secrete adequate levels of an enzyme to aid in digestion. So in general, they're not digesting their food properly. And if they're not digesting their food properly, then they're not able to absorb the nutrients that they need to absorb. Clinical signs, eating well, but losing muscle. They're thin. They have this disgusting runny yellow diarrhea. It's greasy and fatty, this diarrhea, and it smells terrible. And essentially what it is, it's a breakdown and rotting of fat because the body's not able to process the fat, the fat efficiently. The treatment for this disease is pancreatic enzymes just placed on their food for the rest of their life. So it's a quick and easy, fairly quick and easy treatment where it's pancreatic enzyme powder placed on their food. Another clinical application that it's important for you guys to know about is this condition called pancreatitis. So we know that anything that ends with itis is talking generally about inflammation. So this is an inflamed pancreas. When the pancreas is inflamed, so when it's swollen, it's angry, it will not work as well to produce enzymes essential for digestion. So this results in vomiting and diarrhea in a painful abdomen and sometimes in diabetic symptoms because we know that the pancreas also regulates insulin in the body. So if the pancreas is not functioning because it's inflamed and it's angry, then we can get symptoms associated with diabetes as well. The cause is often eating food that was too rich for them. So if we gave a dog that's always on dental diet and we decided to give that dog a steak, then definitely they can get pancreatitis. And treatment is supportive care and a low fat diet. So that typically looks like IV fluids, maybe antibiotics, pain medication for sure, because they're super painful, and a low fat diet, ideally for life. Symptoms of this disease, quite often they are not eating, they have a tender abdomen, and some of them are vomiting. Okay, moving on down, we get to the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is this tiny little organ here. So we've got the stomach, we've got the pancreas that sits just in between the stomach and the duodenum. And then from the pancreatic duct and the duodenum, there is this little common bile duct. So the bile duct connects to this little guy here called the gallbladder. The function of the gallbladder is to store and secrete bile. So bile is produced in the liver and then bile salts break down fat, which emulsifies fat. So if you think about why we need bile, the main purpose of bile is to break down fat in food. So bile is produced in the liver and it's stored and secreted through the gallbladder. Carrying on down the line, we have the large intestine which includes the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. And the rectum, in general, tends to be combined with the anus. So we tend to see literature that considers both similar or at least within the same class. So the colon overall is the main location for absorption of water, vitamins, and electrolytes. The cecum, so that area of the colon, or sorry, of the large intestine, is a blind-ended sac and it has very little function in omnivores and carnivores. And it's mainly active in non-ruminant herbivores such as horses. So it's this tiny little component of the large intestine that really does not have a massive role for the patient. The colon itself, if we're looking at the colon, is divided into three key parts, the ascending, transverse, and descending colon. There's a lot of mucus secretion that occurs in the colon, and it also synthesizes vitamin K. So bacteria, to a degree, are responsible for supporting the synthesis of vitamin K, so they create vitamin K in the body, in the colon. And also super important in the colon is the absorption of water, vitamins, and electrolytes. And then of course, if an animal has diarrhea, why do they get dehydrated? Well, if we're looking at the colon, 
The number one purpose of the colon is absorption of water. So if an animal has diarrhea and they're just pushing that water through, the colon's not able to absorb it. So they get super dehydrated. And I just wanted to bring your attention here. So if we look at our large intestine here, so in this picture it had the appendix, which looks a little, not like an appendix, <laughs> looks a little rude to me. But this is the appendix here and then the cecum and then the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and sigmoid colon is the way they classify it in human medicine because this is a human large intestine. Just super important to know, so this tiny area here, we do not, or sorry, we do. Mammals, other than humans, generally do not have an appendix. Hopefully, humans will be born without one one day, but animals, other than humans, generally do not have an appendix. But you can get an idea of how small that cecum is. It's quite substantially small compared to the rest of the large intestine. So the rectum of the large intestine acts as a storage location for feces. And the anus is the terminal portion of the digestive tract. It has an internal and external sphincter that regulates defecation. So remembering that the sphincter is a round ring of muscle. And why is it impossible to house train goats and horses? Well, mammals in general have differing abilities to control their internal and external sphincter. In general, dogs and cats don't really control their internal sphincter. However, they're able to control their external sphincter. Horses and goats have less control. And they also have a constantly moving GI tract because they're generally constantly ingesting food. So with that being said, they're constantly having to have bowel movements without too much control. Okay, so we're going to head back to the liver because it's a massive organ and it has a huge role in the body. So it's the largest glandular organ in the body. So that means it's the largest organ that secretes something in the body, has many functions. It's involved in carbohydrate storage, and it's involved in the whole process of changing carbohydrates and the whole glycogen process to use, or sorry, to create a usable sugar. Protein metabolism, so it includes the creation of plasma proteins, such as albumin, and we talked about that a little bit, albumin. Fat metabolism, the liver converts fats into their usable parts i.e. phospholipids for cell development, etc, 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 etc. So the liver has a huge role within the body. And then of course what we talked about with liver is that it's connected to the small intestine overall through this hepatic portal vein. So looking here, our portal vein, so it, it connects to the small intestine when the small intestine absorbs nutrients from the food source, it brings it back up through that portal vein into the liver for processing. And that's where the body's able to take some of those sugars, so the carbohydrate, switch it to glycogen so that it can be stored longer in the body for later use. All right, what is the main function of rugae? It is to increase surface area in the stomach. Which cells secrete hydrochloric acid in the stomach? Those are the parietal cells. Food leaving the stomach is called chyme, and that is the correct spelling. Most of the nutrient absorption takes place in the small intestine. The jejunum, duodenum, and ileum are components of the small intestine. A lymphatic capillary in the villi of the intestines is called a lacteal. If the pancreas was not secreting adequate levels of bicarbonate into the duodenum, what could happen? Well, we could get some ulcers. And the treatment of EPI or excrement pancreatic insufficiency includes daily pancreatic enzyme supplements. Bile is created in the liver. The primary role of the large intestine is absorption of water, electrolytes, and vitamins and the largest glandular organ in the body is the liver. All right, nicely done. Lecture one of the COVID-19 pandemic times for anatomy and physiology for vet assistants.